لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنة لا يوم الدين I'll praise you to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on his last prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day the topic which was given to me for uh, handling or presentation in this session concern Islamic history and the rise of sectarianism <laughs> and uh, this topic is of particular relevance to us today here in London, in Britain and in all parts of the Muslim world because of the large numbers of individuals who are claiming for themselves the true path of Islam and in doing so they condemn other individuals large numbers of people relegating them to a state of kufr or shirk and many of us who are new in Islam either by reversion or conversion <coughs> or by coming to an awakening after having been born in a Muslim family but in any case those of us who have a consciousness of what Islam is to some degree and wish to apply that Islam in our personal lives and to see Islam living in the communities around us we are faced with this problem of the various groups or what appears to be various sects that are calling to a variety of different paths the, there is a way to resolve which path in fact is the one which we should be following and we know that Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had said that the Muslim nation would divide up into 73 different sects all of them were going to hell except for one so there is a prediction on the part of the Prophet ﷺ, a prophecy of things to come, things which we are living. And he did provide us with a means of determining which was in fact the correct path. Because he was asked after he said that by the companions, what then is the path? And he said that it is the one that I and my companions are on. He identified it. On other circumstances, he emphasized the holding on to the Quran and Sunnah and that one who does so never goes astray. He advised followers to follow his path, Sunnati wa Sunnat al Khunafa Rashidin and Badi and the path of the righteous caliphs after. And these righteous caliphs have been known by the early Muslims to refer to the first four caliphs, Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali. And this is substantiated also by another statement of the Prophet Muhammad wherein he had said that after me there would be khilafa for, and he gave a figure as to how many years. And he said then it would be followed by kingship. And when the time period was added up of the leadership of Abu Bakr, Omar, Uthman, Ali. This was seen to cover that period of time that was predicted by the Prophet ﷺ with the inclusion of Hassan ibn Ali. That short period of his leadership completed that period of time which the Prophet ﷺ prophesied. So, the Prophet ﷺ, while identifying that there would arise a variety of different sects Sectarianism is something which was unavoidable. He did provide a means for us to determine which one was the right, represented the right way. If we look historically back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad 
we found that there existed individuals who began that path of deviation from his time. Musaylama from the tribe of Banu Tamim had come with a group of people from the Tamim tribe in Eastern Arabia, in what is now known as Nest. They had come to give bay'ah to the Prophet Muhammad and also the legion. But Musaylama stayed back. He did not go forward with the rest. And the Prophet Muhammad spoke about that one who did come. And of the fitna that he would produce later on. And surely, after the time of the Prophet Muhammad when he passed away, Musaylama uh, created one of the largest fitness amongst the Muslim community. The struggle of the early Muslims not only involved Musaylama, but it also involved certain individuals who claimed a new interpretation for Zakah. Abu Bakr, I'm sure you're all familiar with the story of when Abu Bakr sat with the Shura of the leading Sahaba and the Muslim state in Medina was being threatened and they want, and uh, Abu Bakr was advising them that they had to take up arms against those individuals who refused to pay Zakat. And Omar advised him that these people they say, La ilaha illa Muhammad Rasulullah. And they're making trouble. This was Omar's response to Abu Bakr's call to take up arms against those who refused to pay Zakat. Abu Bakr's response was that anyone who made a distinction between Zakat and Salah, as far as he was concerned, had gone up to and they should be fought. In the same way, Salah is a requirement of a Muslim, Zakat is a requirement also of a Muslim. One who denies the compulsory nature of Zakat has left Islam. So he went on to say that whoever paid in the time of the Prophet a hobbling cord worth of Zakat the cord used to tie the foot of the camel so that he not run away, he would make them pay it in his time. But the point here, those people who refused to pay the cow, they had come up with a novel interpretation of what the cow was. They expressed that the cow was a tribute, like the tribute which was paid to the kings, you know, when a king defeats a people, the people are forced to pay tribute to the king. So as the Prophet and the Sahaba and his companions were with him and defeated the various uh, major tribes, the other tribes submitted themselves now to his rule and paid zakat, tribute as they interpreted it to the Prophet Muhammad So when the Prophet Muhammad died, there was no obligation finished. The king is dead. You don't have to pay tribute anymore. That's how they interpreted Zakat. So this misinterpretation led them outside of the bounds of Islam and became a basis under which the companions declared war against them. So we see deviation arising in the case of Musaylama where he claimed prophethood. And he was joined after the time of the Prophet Muhammad also by a female by the name of Sajash. She also claimed prophethood. Later they got married and jointly fought the masses of Muslims. We also see deviation taking place by those who reinterpreted or found new interpretation for the pillars and principles of Islam. Furthermore, in the time of Ali, the fourth caliph, there was an individual by the name of Abdul Mu'ad bin Sabah, of Jewish origin, 
from Yemen, who, along with other individuals, began the promotion of the idea that Ali was somehow special and somehow some aspect of divinity was there with him. When Ali became aware of these statements of, of apostasy in his view, he caught a hold of those who were saying he was making these statements and executed a number of them. When Abdullah bin Salah was finally gotten a hold of and he wanted to execute him also, his companions, the companions of Ali, suggested that he should not do so but to banish this individual because rumors were spreading, it was giving a bad impression that Ali was killing his own followers, those who loved him. So Ali decided to banish this individual. And after his time, this individual came back to restart this fire of fitna, you know, claiming for Ali divinity or aspect of divinity. And this found its way into a movement which began as a political rebellion, the struggle between Ali and Muawiyah, may Allah be pleased with both of them, which ultimately evolved into what we know today as Shia. But prior to their evolution, there was another group. In the time during the struggle between Ali and Muawiyah, there was a group of individuals among the followers of Ali who broke away from Ali's group when Ali decided to hold an arbitration between himself and Muawiyah to resolve their differences and end the fitna. A group broke away, known as the Seceders, or in Arabic they're known as Al Khawarij. They broke away from the main body of Ali's followers and declared both Ali and Muawiyah to be Kafirs. Because they chose to come to a decision not according to the book of Allah. <coughs> That's how they viewed the principle of arbitration which they attempted to put into place. They viewed it, these individuals who broke off the Khawarij, they viewed this as giving the judgment to other than Allah. And now these individuals, Ali ended up having to fight them. The arbitration broke down and he ended up having to fight these individuals as these individuals themselves started to attack the main body of Muslims. They began an inquisition where in wherever, whatever area they moved into, they would put people to the test as to their views concerning Ali and Muawiyah. Those who held that these individuals were righteous companions of the Prophet who had been guaranteed paradise as stated by the Prophet such individuals were executed. They committed heinous crimes in the name of preserving the purity of Islam and removing deviation, when in fact they were themselves deviation. And it is reported by those who went to their camp to try to convince them to come back over and to give up these views. And following these attempts, a, a number of them did rejoin the main body of, of Ali and his companions. However, the people who went to see them, they mentioned, is recorded in what is called Asar of the Sahaba, or statements of the Sahaba that are recorded, authentic, that when they came near to the camp, the encampment of these Khawarij, they said they heard a sound which sounded like many, many bees, a, a humming. They were wondering, what in the world is this? When they came up to the camp, they realized these people were involved in the recitation of the Qur'an. Late at night, they were there reciting, avidly reciting the Qur'an. And when they went in to sit with them, these people all had 
marks on their foreheads. Most of them, they had these marks on their foreheads from making so much sujood. They prayed. Excessive. And they took the position which became a part of the principles of this madhab or this school of thought sect which deviated from mainstream Islam and it took the position that one who committed a sin was doomed to hell there was no repentance so now if you take that position that if you commit a sin you are doomed to hell what kind of individual are you going to be? You should be an extremely righteous individual. So they took on much of the trappings of what represents righteousness in Islam in terms of Salah and, and uh, recitation of the Quran and these type of things. Very conscientious about it. However, due to their misinterpretation of the Quran, they unleashed and sincerely committed to the practice of Islam and the worship of Allah. But if they have a misinterpretation of the Quran, that can be enough to take them out of the bounds of Islam. And as time passed, you found through the history, individuals in different places who would claim for themselves either prophethood or that they were Mahdi's, you know. And uh, Mahdi is a little lighter than prophethood. I mean, you claim prophethood, really, you're gone. You're out. Finish. Mahdi, one can say, well, such a person who claimed he was a Mahdi, not he went out of Islam, but that he was wrong. That was a wrongful claim. But the point is that from that period of time down to our, our time, we find people who have made various claims for themselves. In the last century, we found the forces of colonialism utilizing certain individuals amongst the Muslim masses to create fitna by promoting their claims. We have the Qadianis, Ghulam Ahmed of Qadian of India who claimed himself to be a prophet and his followers are still around today promoting their teachings in Africa mostly they have been declared by the World Muslim League in Pakistan as being a non-Muslim sect in some years back we had the Baha'is who arose in Iran they were a branch which broke off from uh, the Twelver Shiites. And in even more recent times, we had in America, in the early 20s, Noble Drew Ali, who claimed prophethood for himself. His group called the Moorish Science Temple of America. He was followed closely by Elijah Muhammad, who also claimed for himself prophethood, and went a little further to claim that his teacher was God incarnate. And following him, in the 70s, Elijah was, you know, made his claims in the 30s, and that carried on. In the 70s, uh, actually beginning in the late 60s, we had uh, another individual, Dwight York, who calls himself now Isa al-Hadi al-Mahdi who in his writings claims for himself divinity claims he's God incarnate he works miracles etc and in the later 70s we had Rashad Khalifa an Egyptian who came to America claimed that he found the mathematical numerical miracle of the Quran in the form of the number 19 and on the basis of that he started to make further claims for himself that he was able to determine the day of on which Yom al Qiyamah would take place the day of judgment you know, when the world would end he claimed he found out when it was then he later went on to deny the validity of the Sunnah 
and went further to claim that certain verses of the Quran were false. And in 1985, he claimed that he was a prophet. His miracle being the discovery of the 19. Alhamdulillah, a year ago he was executed. May those who killed him attain paradise. But this is the process. The process of deviation. It hasn't ended. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had told us at the end of our prayers to seek refuge. Seek refuge from the trials of the grave. The trials of hell. The punishments of hell. The trials of living and dying. And from the evil trial of the false Christ and Dajjal. And this Dajjal is not what is talked about in the book that we have for sale called Dajjal. That is a book of fiction, not fact. But Dajjal being the greatest of those who claim for himself prophethood or some form of divinity, he would come as one of the signs of the last day. However, the Prophet Muhammad had said that before him would come a number of minor dead jails. And this is what we have experienced. There is no end to it. Only with the ending of the world. The last one being Masih al Dajjal. So what this takes us back to is the message which the Prophet ﷺ gave us, whereby we may protect ourselves from falling into the clutches of these various Dajjals. And on one occasion, when he sat with his companions, he drew a line in the dust, and he drew on either side a number of other lines branching off from it. And he asked them, do you know what this is? And they said, Allah and his messenger knows best. He said, this line down the middle is the straight path, my path. And these others represent the many deviant paths. At the head of each one is a devil calling to it. And this is what we are faced with. As we seek Islam, we seek to practice Islam, that there are many devils out there calling, enticing people to come and join their path. But their paths lead to hell. And the Prophet ﷺ had given us a series of principles which help us to protect ourselves from falling into that hell. Among them is a principle that he said, every innovation in the religion is a cursed innovation. Bidah. And every cursed innovation leads to hell. It's given us this general principle. Those who are at the head of these paths, the devils who are calling people to hell, their call is based on deviation. This is how we know who they are. <coughs> they are deviants. And the message that they are giving will be deviation. However, it will not be all deviation. Because if they come with pure falsehood, open corruption, they will not attract people. People who are seeking the right path. They will not attract them. So they must bring to them something of the truth. Something of the truth, they must bring it. This is what will attract the people. But this is just the bait to pull them in. Because once they're in, then they set them on a path of deviation. And the deviation can take many, many different forms. But primarily, we know, as the Prophet Muhammad told us, that the foundation of the message is the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So if a deviant wants to be successful, 
He must block the people from either one or both. Because the Qur'an cannot be taken without the Sunnah, nor can the Sunnah be taken without the Qur'an. They are both based on revelation from Allah. Allah has said in the Qur'an, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ In reference to Prophet Muhammad Sallam, he did not speak of his own desires. For what he spoke was revelation which was revealed to him. So, the Sunnah, what the Prophet Muhammad Sallam said and did and approved things which were done in his presence, this was based on revelation from Allah. It represents the clarification of the message of the Qur'an, the clarification, the implementation of that message. As Allah said, وَأَنزَلْنَا إِلَيْكَ الذِّكْرَ لِتُبَيِّنَ لِلنَّاسِ مَا نُزِّلَ إِلَيْهِمْ We have revealed to you, O Muhammad, the reminder, the Qur'an, in order that you may clarify for the people what was revealed for them. This was the job of the Prophet Muhammad When Aisha was asked about the character of the Prophet Muhammad how was his character? She said his character was the Qur'an. So he represents in his practice, in his sayings, in the things which he approved in his presence, he represents the implementation of the Qur'an. So we cannot separate the Sunnah from the Qur'an. We cannot separate it. And the Prophet ﷺ warned us that there would come a time when a man would be leaning on a couch and he'll hold up the Qur'an and say, whatever I find halal in here, I'll make halal. Whatever I find haram in here, I'll make haram. In other words, he's just going to follow the Qur'an. However, Prophet ﷺ went out to say that he made certain things haram which were not mentioned in the Qur'an. But this was based on revelation from Allah. So these cannot be separated. The Qur'an and the Sunnah. As he said, I left with you two things. You hold on to them firmly. You will never go astray. The book of Allah and my Sunnah. These two are together. Cannot be separated. So now, those who seek a path of deviation, they will seek to separate these two. And they will seek to nullify these two. The nullification can come either by openly stating it's not authentic, they say we don't follow sunnah, it is the hadith of people, the speech of men, like Dr. York and his compatriots, you know, and Rashad Khalifa and others. Or they may seek to interpret the hadith in fashions which were not understood by the early companions of the Prophet Muhammad and the early scholars of Islam. They make their own, come up with their own interpretations. And those who are bold enough, they will go all the way to the Qur'an. And Allah warns us in the Qur'an. He says that among the verses of the Qur'an are what is known as muhkamat. Those which are firm, clear in their wording, Understanding them requires no special deep interpreting. It's very clear. And these, Allah said, were Ummul Kitab, the essence of the book, the foundation of the book. Besides them, were Ukharu Mutashabihat. There were other verses whose meanings are obscure. The meanings are obscure, which we do not understand, but which the scholars those who are firmly grounded in knowledge say that they're all from Allah. They hold back. They do not seek to go into the interpretation of these verses. However, Allah says that those who have twisted hearts, they will head straight for these verses. These are the verses that they will pick up and try to bring for you what this means and what that means. And furthermore, after they have got you going with that, then they will go right over to even the muhkamat. So the whole Qur'an becomes symbolic. Its meanings are not to be understood except by a, an elite few who have special knowledge. This is the course 
of deviation. So, we can summarize the history of sectarianism in Islam as one wherein people either misinterpreted the Quran or they misinterpreted the Sunnah. Either separated the Sunnah from the Quran or cancelled the validity of the Sunnah and changed the meanings of the Quran. How can we protect ourselves from this? The only way in which we are able to ensure that we remain on that path, the one path that the Prophet Muhammad said was the correct path leading to paradise, is to not only hold on firmly to the Quran and Sunnah, but to understand the Quran and Sunnah according to how it was understood by the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and by the early scholars of Islam. This is the way that we can be certain. Because once we allow ourselves the free reign to interpret what you have then is individuals coming up as I was approached by one individual trying to defend the smoking of marijuana. He said, it's in the Quran. I said, yeah, please, please show me. Where in the Quran is marijuana made halal? He said, look here, brother. In Surah Al-Baqarah, when Musa was, uh, you know, with his people and they were uh, going to the, the town, Allah made allowable for them the pot herbs. You know the herbs? Use the family's translation. Vegetables is translated as pot herbs. Herbs which are cooked in the pot. So he said, there it is, brother. The herb. Herb, you know, H-E-R-B. So there. It's made allowed for Musa. This is a course of deviation here. We take the English translation of the Quran and then we're making tafsir of the English. You know, one brother was explaining to me, you know, where Allah says you should fight the believers just as they fight you. So now this became a rationale, you know, because they say, well, you know, we are living in this country, all these disbelievers around us, they're fighting us in so many different ways. You know, it's no longer a physical fight. This is now a psychological fight. It's an economic fight, you know. So now this became justification for robbing banks and snatching purses and you know <laughs> you know this is what this is where you can go you know I met brothers who were involved in astrology you know one brother who was a Muslim and uh, he was an astrologist preparing charts for people and predicting their future and everything else I said brother this is haram he said it's in the Quran I said please show me where the Quran is the astrology is you know haram so he went to Yusuf Ali's translation again and he opened up the chapter known as Al-Buruj. Yusuf Ali has translated Al-Buruj as the zodiacal signs. Allah is swearing by the zodiacal signs. I said, oh, for Allah. Of course, Buruj does not mean zodiacal signs. Later on, you know, when Arabic uh, took on the Arabic language, you know, there was classical meanings of Arabic, but, you know, as the Arabic spread, uh, its meaning, some of the meanings became modified to include certain other concepts which existed in the society. And this was one classical example. Originally, Buruj meant the constellations, the star formations, not the superimposed images, you know, of, of Leo and, and, and the others, you know, over it, which came out of Babylon and Greece, you know, based on star worship, etc. It's is not referring to that. However, later on, the concept of Buruj came to include that. So, once we take the English Quran and we start to allow our minds to interpret it as it hits our minds, then we are heading off in a path of deviation. 
Allah said that He revealed Quran and Arabic. He revealed an Arabic Quran. The Quran is the Arabic text. That English that you're reading is not the Quran. It is not the Quran. It is an explanation of the meanings in English, a tafsir, an interpretation. And that is why, you know, we have the issue of can you touch the Qur'an whether you have wudu or if a woman is in her menses and these type of things. In the case of the translations of the Qur'an, Yusuf Ali is perfectly okay because this is not, this is not classified as Qur'an. Once you have the words of other than the Qur'an, more than the Qur'an itself, then it becomes allowable for you to handle this without being in a state of wudu. Based on the fact that the Prophet sent letters to the kings of Rome and Persia, which had Quranic verses in it, but it also had statements from the Prophet, and he knew he was sending it to them and that they were disbelievers of what they may do with it. So it is no longer considered, according to the scholars, they identify that once the words of other than Allah are greater in a text than the words of Allah, that text is no longer considered to be Quran in and of itself. So the rules no longer apply. So, this is very important because there's another aspect of it that you know, we should be very clear on. Because Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah that if you do not believe that this is a revelation from Allah, then produce one chapter like it. If you go to the end of the Quran, pick up, you know, in the Hassan al you know, three lines in English, I'm sure you can get, you know, a modern poet, or if you took it to Shakespeare or Wordsworth or whatever in English, he could write a better set of uh, verses than those which were written by Yusuf Ali or Marmaduke Pixal or whoever else. And if it meant that this was what Allah was referring to, then it means that the challenge of Allah has been met. Well, in fact, it cannot be met. It was not met. And it, and it was not met in the Arabic, because this is where the miracle of the Quran lies. So the Quran, in essence, is an Arabic Quran. For us to understand and to interpret and to be able to, to apply effectively and correctly, we must have a firm grounding in the sciences of the Qur'an. And similarly with the Sunnah, it is necessary for us to have a good background when we want to apply something of the Sunnah which appears to be contrary to what is the norm. I'm not saying you can, none of us can pick up the Qur'an, we can't pick up the Sunnah you know, in English and read it and benefit from it and do it. I'm saying you can and we should. You don't have Arabic, that's what you must do. But you should realize that you have in front of you some limitations. Therefore, you don't pick it up and just start making your interpretations. You will find in the Quran much which is very clear, very straightforward, doesn't require any kind of interpretation or anything. That you read, you go with. When you find something that, you know, its meaning isn't really clear and so on, so don't get into that. Better you go and you ask some brothers, learned brothers who have, you know, studied sciences of the Quran, etc., who can bring the clarification for you. This is what you do. Save yourself from deviation. Similar with the Sunnah. You know, you see people doing many different things. You read the authentic traditions, for example, in Bukhari Muslim, and Muatta, so and so, uh, and you see things in there which people are doing, but it's identified in there. This gives you clarity. Yes, this is from the Sunnah. This is from the way of the Prophet Muhammad But if you come across something which seems to be, you know, at odds with what everybody is practicing, then don't grab onto that thing and say, well, ah, this is the sunnah, people are not far No, Better again, you sit with somebody who's learned to get clarification, because this may be something which was done in the early period of Islam, which was later abrogated. You know? And you don't have sufficient uh, reading to understand and to know that, for example, this was done at that period and it no longer was done. You have a verse in the Quran where Allah says, for example, don't come to Salah in a state of intoxication. You may pick up that verse and say, huh? It's okay, I can get intoxicated, but just not at the time when I have to go and pray. If you don't know that in fact this was one of a series of verses which were revealed, and that it was superseded by later verses which prohibited alcohol absolutely. So, similar to the case of the Sunnah. And we can protect, we can find that path. The path of those who have attained success in this life. And the next. By holding on firmly to the Quran and Sunnah, according to how it was understood and practiced by the companions of the Prophet and the early generation of righteous scholars who followed them. So with that, 
I will close this uh, brief presentation, allowing you an opportunity to raise any questions on the subject. Uh, those who would like to raise it uh, by directly speaking, we'll take some from you, as well as those who would like to write their questions and send them forward, you're welcome to do so. Uh, the sisters may do the same. Before, before we get into the questions, can I just add to that that those who want to make their questions direct, then we have a microphone here. Please come to the microphone and do it that way, inshallah. And then just to draw your attention to um, one or two changes we've had to make to the program. Um, this session will be ending, inshallah, at 4 o'clock, after which we'll have an hour's break from 4 to 5, during which we'll also pray for the Asr. Um, after that, then we'll go into the session entitled Towards Understanding the Hadith and the Sunnah, inshallah. So the first question. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Binad. You mentioned the verse, fight them as they fight you. Is it qatilahum kama qatilahum? Is that the, 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 the ayat, small ayat you mentioned just now? Yeah, well, not quite as you pronounce it. Yes, yes. Can I ask about it, please? Um, if a Muslim country were to be invaded by kufar and they're using mustard gas, or, yeah, something like that, which can destroy a palm tree or an olive, can poison wells, and can harm indiscriminately women, old people and children. Are we allowed to, res to resist them, defend ourselves against them as they fight us? Can we fight them as they fight us? Can we use such chemicals against them knowing fully well that uh, there are other prohibitions that we ought to take care of when we are fighting war? A uh, second question, if I may just ask really quickly. Um, I will say it in English because I don't seem to be able to pronounce it in Arabic like Khafiddin or something. There is no compulsion in religion. Is that mansukh? Is it abrogated? Um, these are two questions. Shukran okay. Jazeelah. Uh, the first question, we are not allowed to do anything that the, the disbelievers may do to us in the course of war. There are clear injunctions given by Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu which pro prohibit us from doing certain actions in the course of our fighting, destroying uh, trees, vegetation, you know, uh, fruit trees, etc. Uh, the killing of children, non-combatants, uh, destruction of uh, the worshipping places of the Jews and the Christians. Hindus are not included, and Buddhists are not included here. Uh, a variety of other injunctions have been given for the Muslim Mujahid, the one who is fighting. And this is one of the examples which may be given to help to clarify that this verse does not mean as people have, you know, misinterpreted to mean. We have, we are fighting a cause for the sake of Allah. For the madhab, or the concept of the madhab, we should first understand before we can put it in context with Aqidah. The madhab comes, the term madhab itself comes from Arabic verb sahaba means to go. And a madhab literally means a way of going or a way. It refers historically to the collection of opinions of any given scholar or group, whether they be philosophical or legal or spiritual, and in fact are not in any way binding on the Ummah as a whole, in that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had said to us quite clearly, Surat Tufikum Amrain, I've left the two things, in Tamasakum Bihima Nansudil Abadah. If you hold on to them firmly, you will never go astray. It's the law of Sunnah, the Book of Allah and my Sunnah. The concept of madhab was not specifically included here at all. This is the foundation from which we understand our religion. So, what of what is known as madhab are not in fact binding on the Muslims in the sense that. It is something which each and every person must choose, must follow, you know, otherwise their religion is in some way or some shape, you know, incomplete, efficient. 
I'm just saying that to to put the the idea from the very beginning, you know, in its context. I've got a view, and hopefully, you know, the view that I'm presenting to you. I mean, I make it very clear that it is my view, but it's not my view alone in the sense that I'm bringing something which is new to you. You know, I have a particular madhab, and I'm going to now bring this particular madhab to you. I'm expressing to you a view which is based on the position held by scholars from the past all the way from the time of the Sahaba till today. This is the position uh, commonly known uh, in present day terms as the position of the Salaf. I mean, I do not uh, particularly call myself a Salaf per se, you know, but anyone who intends to follow Islam as it was revealed has to be in concept a Salaf. Salaf being uh, the righteous early scholars of Islam and, and rep- it represents their understanding of Islam because though we say that we follow the Quran and Sunnah in fact every deviant group says it follows the Quran and Sunnah so though as the Prophet said that we hold on to these two we will never go astray at the same time in another statement of his he also made reference to following Sunnati wa Sunnati al-Khulafa al-Rashidin and Ba'di and the Sunnah of the righteous guided caliphs after them. So, there is pointing by the Prophet to the way of his companions, the leading figures amongst them. And we also had him say on another occasion that the best of generations is my generation. Then those that come after them, then those that come after them. These are all sort of pointers to let us know that, that really that understanding of the early generation is of importance to us. Because ultimately it is what separates those who are following the Quran and Sunnah as it should be followed and those who are not. So as I said, everybody, in order to maintain some form of legitimacy must claim that they are following the Qur'an, the Sunnah. However, it is how do we understand the Qur'an and Sunnah which separates between those who are in fact following it as the Prophet Muhammad intended and those who are interpreting it in their own manner to suit their own ideas which are in fact deviant, which are deviated from the main uh, road which the Prophet Muhammad left for us to follow. So, though the concept of madhab is not in and of itself binding on the Muslims, you know, to say, I follow this madhab or I follow that madhab, we are obliged to follow the Qur'an and the Sunnah in accordance with the understanding <coughs> that was held by the companions of the Prophet Muhammad that are also of the early scholars of Islam. The Maha is something I did not understood today meaning that one is either a Shafi, Maliki, Hanbali, or Hanafi. It is something which we have inherited, which developed at a particular period in time, Muslim history, and which we have inherited, those of us who have converted to Islam, those of us who were born in Islam and have become converted to the need to practice it. Uh, we find ourselves in a situation where we have a body of practices which have been handed down over the generations and which Muslims as a whole, in most of the Muslim world, have taken particular portions of and held on as the correct way or their correct way. When we look historically, we see that these particular schools of thought, legal schools of thought, evolved out of particular circumstances, particular needs, 
I won't go into the details of it because that would be a lecture in itself. Uh, there's a book which I have written which is available which our brother mentioned, Evolution of Six, which is in fact Evolution of the Madhans, how they evolve, etc. You know, those of you who would like to read more deeply on the subject, inshallah the books will be available afterwards and you can, you know, get yourself a copy and read in more depth on it if you haven't already. I, I would just like to look more from the point of view of our relationship, you know, with the Madhans. We know some people who have taken a position that the Madhams are haram. It is haram to follow the Madhams. Okay. You have some who have taken a position that they are wise. You've got to follow the Madhams. And we have to decide for ourselves really what position should we Truly, as I said, the concept of the madhab, as it is known today, was not uh, prescribed by the Prophet Muhammad nor his companion. So, we really cannot say that it is logic. And some people actually who say it is logic go overboard to the point where they have even added this as one of the questions of the grave. I read this in a book written by Hussein Ishik a writer out of uh, Turkey. He's written a number of different books, you know, really promoting very strongly the idea that one must follow a madhab. And if you don't follow a madhab, then Satan is your imam. And he added in there that, you know, we all know about when a person dies and um, he is questioned in the grave, you know, he is asked, you know, who is your Lord? Who was your prophet or the person who was sent to you? You know, what is your religion? He also added to this, and what was your matter? He added this again. We'll be asking the thing. This is an extreme, you know, view. I'm not saying that, you know, people who follow my have told this, but I'm just saying that this is where it can end up. And those who hold on to it very strongly, they take a, you know, position uh, which may be similar to this. On the other hand, those who say it is haram, in my view, have also gone to another extreme. Because when you look at what the madhab is, in fact, in the sense of it being a trend of thought, uh, a mode of interpretation and, and application of the sunnah, we see that this was in existence from the time of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad So the, the fact that some of the companions took a particular mode or followed a particular approach to the interpretation and implementation of the sunnah, while others took another approach, which was fundamentally saying that there were some variances in, you know, how they applied it. This existed from their time, and to say it is haram is really, you know, a, a blanket indictment of the, even the early generation of this. So then we are. What I feel or what I would propose is that truly we're not obliged to follow a particular madhab by a particular name. But at the same time, it is perfectly reasonable for us to follow the mode of thinking of an individual scholar, groups of scholars, you know, over a period of time to start here. However, this following, and this following has to do with our dependence. I mean, if you start to study about this law, your, your body of knowledge is limited. You have to follow the thoughts of someone. Either it is a scholar who has written a book, or it is an imam in a masjid, you know, or the general trend of the people, of the area, the people who taught you Islam initially, whatever. You will be following a thought or an approach to the sunnah. It is natural. However, your position should be that you are following this thought or way as a means of understanding and implementing the Quran and the sunnah. And 
it was understood by the early scholars. This should be your understanding. In that, what does that mean? It means to us that if at any time we come across anything written or we hear anything said, which seems to be in contradiction to the Quran and the Sunnah, then we have to leave what we hear or what we read. And we do not elevate it to the point where we will follow it blindly. What is actually prohibited in Islam is the blind following of anyone other than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is the only one that we are expected to follow blindly. Because this is the meaning of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God, nothing worthy of worship but Allah and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last messenger of Allah. This is what this means. When we make a declaration, it's not merely just accepting that Muhammad وسلم, was the last messenger of Allah. It means that that acceptance is a commitment. A commitment to following him because of the fact that what he brought was from Allah. Because we're not following him in fact, we're not following him as an individual. We're following him as the conveyor of the message, the final message of Allah to mankind. He is the means by which Allah conveyed that final message to us. So we're not following him as a man. Now again, some people go over the world in this in this area. We're following him as the messenger of Allah. <laughs> And in following him, we are following Allah. Because Allah has said, فَمَنْ يُطِعَ الرَّسُولُ فَقَدْ أَطَعَ Allah. This is from the Qur'an itself. Allah says in the Qur'an, whoever obeys the messenger, obeys Allah. So obedience to the messenger is obedience to Allah. So when we are following him, we are following the commandments of Allah. So this is required of us. And this means, as I said, that no one, no opinion, no idea of any group, individual, country, community, can take precedence over what the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, has brought for us. So, I'm saying that we cannot escape following in Ashab. But we should not be rigid in our following of the Mashab. We should be flexible in the sense that wherever the truth is, we look at the Mashab as a means of collecting that truth for us. They represent the scholars of that period or individuals who have gathered the information for us. But they are not infallible. They are not infallible. They were not guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was guided. So it means that they will make mistakes. And surely, if you go through the four different schools of Islamic law, what are commonly known as the Malhaf, you will find in each and every one of their mistakes. <coughs> their errors. Their rulings. And the so-called founders of these schools themselves warn their students of this factor, the human factor, that they were not in and of themselves infallible. They gave rulings based on the knowledge that had come to them, but they didn't have all the knowledge. The collections of hadith that we know now as Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Muatta, you know, Abu Dawood, Salah Abi Dawood, and, and the others, these took place after the time of the great Imams who founded or are looked at as being the founders of the schools of Islamic law. So this is telling us that the major gathering of the Sunnah took place after their time. So naturally, it was not possible for any one of them to grasp all of the Sunnah. The Sahaba had spread to different parts of the Muslim Ummah. And they passed on what knowledge they had in their various areas. So, 
None of the individuals of the past had all of the knowledge. So naturally, there would be some rulings that they made based on partial knowledge. You know, it's not to say that they were just making, you know, rulings just purely based on, uh, on opinion. No. They would look back into the Quran, look into the Sunnah, and they would make a ruling based on what they had of the Quran and Sunnah. And in a certain, to a certain degree, each and every one of us has to do the same. We read the Quran, we read the Sunnah, we, hear, we learn from people in our midst, you know, who are scholars, who have studied abroad, or who have been exposed to Islamic knowledge, whatever, we get information from them. And circumstances arise where we have to make decisions. How do we make these decisions? We make it based on the knowledge that we have. Is this not knowledge perfect? No. It will never be. Perfect knowledge belongs only to Allah. Therefore, in our judgments, we will make some mistakes. We are human beings. We will make some mistakes in our judgments. But the point is that when we make a mistake, we should not be so rigid, you know, people get into a position where when you make a mistake and, uh, you know, it's pointed out to you, you feel that it is a personal attack. You know, you feel it's a personal attack on you and your person. So now you must defend. You start to find arguments to defend what you know inside yourself to be wrong. This is, this is where the problem arises now. This is because one of the students of Imam Malik, for example, explained that on one occasion he, he was sitting with Imam Malik with a group and Imam Malik was asked so many questions, something like 36 different questions. And to read 36 different questions, you know, to, to 31 or 32 out of the 36, he said, I don't know. Yeah. Imam Malik was ignorant. But it didn't, he was not shy to say, I don't know. He didn't feel that because I am the scholar here, I must have an answer for every question. Because again, this is a, this creates a problem amongst us. Where a person who is in a position of educating others feels that if he is not able to, under, uh, to answer every single question which is raised, somehow he will be, you know, looked at as being inferior. And the people will look at him in this fashion. Well, he couldn't answer this question, he couldn't answer this question. It's a mistaken view of people who question those who have some body of knowledge. And it's a mistaken view of those who have somebody of knowledge to look in this fashion that they must be able to answer in each and every question. Because when you take that position, then the chances of you making major mistakes become greater and greater. It is no shame for one to say, I don't know. I'm a this as far as I know. And I'll tell you what I have, but you know, it may very well be incorrect to with other people. I will go back and check this in more detail for you and try to you know, bring a more reliable answer for you. So, we have to recognize the fallibility of people. We follow based on whatever information has been given to us. So that information is only as good as it is in keeping with the teachings of the Quran and the Sunnah. You know, as Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Shafi'i were both quoted to have said, in a Sahal Hadith, Sahu Madhabi. If the Hadith is authentic, then it is in fact my Madhab. They come in themselves. They're telling you, I'm giving you what I have. But if you find an authentic hadith from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then that is what I really wanted to follow. And you follow that and leave what I said. And in fact, they made statements similar to this. That, you know, if you find any contradiction between what I'm saying and, and what you find in the Quran or from the Sunnah, then throw mine aside and you follow that. This was their position. And this is the approach, this is the way that flexible, open-minded way in which we should go about seeking knowledge. Recognizing the contribution of the early scholars, but not becoming so attached to any one individual or any one pattern, so much so that we become blinded to all others. We want to raise its superiority above all others, you know. I remember as I was told when I first accepted Islam and I traveled with the Jamaat Tabliq, uh, and this is not to say anything specific against the Jamaat Tabliq, but just to relay something that incident that occurred, which occurred to me at that time, that um, I was informed, you know, at that time, being a new uh, member of Islam, that um, everybody has to follow a mashat. I was told this. They're all equal, they explained. They're all the same. You know, whether you 
individuals one of the four are not the same. However, they added, most people on the earth follow Imam Abu Hanifa. So then I'm telling you they're all equal, it doesn't matter if they follow. They're giving me now reasons why, in fact, I would not say it directly, I should really be following Imam Abu Hanifa. And, you know, so this is sort of a representation of, you know, we could say, madhab rivalry. You know, where a person feels, oh, I'm from this madhab, it's my tradition, it's my culture, it's my way, it's my people, my community, whatever, you know, I must defend it against the others. But no, this was not the way of the companions at all. This was not the way of the early scholars of Islam. Imam al-Shafi, he studied under Imam Malik for some 20 odd years. He memorized the Murtah. He was one of the narrators of the Murtah, the collection of hadith which Imam Malik taught. After that, he went to the region of Iraq to study under the students of Imam Abu Hanifa. Imam Abu Hanifa died at that time. He went and he studied under you know, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad al-Shaybani, mostly under Muhammad al-Shaybani. And he gathered that information and he wrote at that time a book you know, of legal interpretation of the Sunnah for its application called Al-Hujjah. The evidence or the proof. Later, following his period of study there for some five so years, he headed to Egypt to go and study under another Imam, many of you have never even heard of, his name is al Lays Ibn Sa'ad. And he was a major Imam of the same standing of Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik and the others. He went to Egypt to study on them, but however, by the time he got there, uh, Imam Lays was already dead. So he studied under Imam Lays' students. And after studying under Imam Lays' students, you know, gathering that information which <coughs> Imam Lays had gathered himself, he said, you know, Imam Lays was a greater legis, legal scholar than Imam Malik. However, his weak his students have caused his approach, his madhab, to be lost. This is a man now who studied for 20 years under Imam Malik. This is what he was given, this analysis he was given. Actually, Imam Lays, though his, his madhab, as far as we know, disappeared, people don't follow the same madhab. Follow the lazy man, why anybody saying that? But Imam Shafi, who studied under the ideas of this, from his, in his opinion, he felt that Imam Lewis was a stronger meaning. I mean, everybody has different levels, you know, in understanding and interpretation. And this is not to say uh, anything about the individual per se, but Allah has blessed different people with greater understanding than others. He's put people over people. This is the sunnah of Allah. He did not make us all the same in the sense of understanding beauty, strength, wealth, etc., etc. We're the same in the sense that we all have to stand responsible to Allah based on the knowledge that we have. We're same in that sense. But in the sense of ability to understand, this is something Allah has given. Some people more than others. Beauty, handsomeness, you know, makes some people more attractive than others. Well, is given them to his mercy more than others. So Imam Ashafi, looking at the rulings of both of these scholars, after studying what they taught, gave his opinion that Imam Lewis was actually a stronger Egypt, legal scholar. However, he was giving us a reality here. The weakness of his students caused his approach to be lost. And in other words, it, did, it was not standing there as a major school in that time any longer. It had lost uh, its ascendancy. Whereas the school of Imam Malik was strong and going strong. That of Abu Hanifa was strong and going strong. However, he absorbed much of what Imam Lays taught, and after having absorbed that, he wrote a new book called Al Um. The mother, literally, uh, really means like the essence, the essence of his ideas, you know, what he had gathered. And in it, he reversed 
No end of rulings that you have learned in this earlier book called al This is why those people who study Sharia now from a comparative point, they refer to the old madhab of a Shafi and the new madhab of a Shafi. In other words, he changed. Major change. There was no problem for him. Because as he said, you know, he was following the Sunnah. Where the evidence came, that's where he went. So there was no problem for him to reverse, you know, a huge percentage of his early rulings and take this new position. So ultimately, we can say that no individual madhab encompasses all of Islam. However, when we take them all together, we have Islam. It is in God. It is, in, it is there. When we take one and we want to push this one along, then we are denying the portion of Islam. And we are no longer following Muhammad Rasulullah sallam, anymore. We are following a madhab. We are following a madhab now. We have put this between ourselves and following Muhammad so, this is how we should look at the Madhab. Imagine, this is how we should look at the Madhab as a whole. They, within them, you find Islam. However, no individual encompasses all of Islam. They are the efforts, human efforts of human beings, and as such, in them there are errors. And when Imam Malik was asked on one occasion, if we follow a Sahabi, one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If we follow him, if we choose one who follow him in everything he said and he did, all his rulings, etc., will we be on the right path? Imam Malik said, no, unless he was correct. Because the truth is one. The truth is one. So, when you hear a statement of Imam Malik and when you hear a statement that is commonly quoted, it's one of the statements I heard when I first came to Islam also, Ashabi ka nuju, my companions are like stars. The ayyim is kadeitum is kadeitum. Any one of them that you follow, you will be rightly guided. Sounds beautiful. So when you look at that in relationship with what Imam Malik said, well, you realize there's something wrong here. In fact, this so-called tradition is a fabrication. It is not authentic. It is not true. Because the Sahaba, as much as we hold them in honor, companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who conveyed Islam to us, they were human beings. And they made mistakes. But we're not as large. And we, in fact, we would be incorrect to follow the mistake of a Sahabi knowing that what he, the position he held was in fact wrong and a mistake. It would be wrong. Because when we, if we did that, then we again would be putting an individual between us and following Muhammad Rasulullah the second half of our shahada we'll be destroying the second half of the shahada so now this is where the issues of aqidah come aqidah meaning our faith the fundamentals of our faith that whenever we put any individual between ourselves and the following of the Prophet Muhammad then we are in fact destroying an aspect of our aqidah our faith this is very, this is this is critical now because this is the Shahada plan. The, the two declarations of faith. La ilaha illallah, Muhammad or Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the last messenger of Allah. This is the foundation. If either of these two are destroyed, our Islam is destroyed. We're left in ruins. We're left astray, deviant. So what happens is that whenever a person decides to follow anyone else blindly, he destroys the second half of his face. You see, and this is one of the areas in which what is commonly known today as Sufism, you know, the mystic path, the secret way, this particular path attacks the foundations of faith because it is common amongst those who follow the mystic path that when the sheikh, the peer, the leader 
of that particular madhab amongst the various mystical madhabs becomes your leader, you must become his, what is called, murid. One who has submitted his will. You give up your will. You do not question. You follow this man in any decision he makes. Whatever he tells you to do. You see, this approach is, you know, a, you could say a concentrated version of destruction of the foundations of faith. And any individual who promotes such a view or such a path is a deviant, has deviated from the way of Islam. So, just in summarizing for you, and this presentation is only meant to be a brief introduction to the idea, the thought, for some reflection. Uh, I wanted to give you most of the time to give me some feedback, some questions in relationship to this topic because I know that it is one which affects the community, Muslim community, no matter where people are. And it's good for you to put these ideas out for general discussion, for clarification, for exchange of ideas, understanding. So I'm just going to summarize again briefly the concept of the madhab in relationship to Akida. And that is that each and every Muslim is obliged to follow the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam blindly. His way has to be our way without question. As long as the information that is coming to us is authentic. You know, we have to have this condition. Because you might find somebody saying, well, this is the way of Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, you have people known amongst the Sufi as the whirling dervishes coming out of uh, Turkey where they stand over these big long treasures and, and they have one hand down one up and they spin around in circles and they say, this is Zikr and this is the way of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, so you find people saying this was his way, you know, all over. We have to discern, we have to look into the traditions, the authentic collections of the traditions and determine what in fact was the way of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and when we find that way, then we have to follow that way blindly. Meaning that we don't have to understand what the Prophet Muhammad has said, you know, in the complete sense before we can apply it. For example, he said 1400 years ago, that it is better that we do not lie on our stomachs. Sleep on your stomachs. This is the way the people get up by. Okay. Now, the companions at the time, they didn't ask him, why why? Why, 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 why can't you sleep on our stomachs? Why? Generations have passed of Muslims who, because of their commitment to the Kalima, to the declarations of faith, they chose not to lie on their stomachs. Not knowing ultimately the harm that was there. They just knew that if the Prophet Muhammad told us it's better not to do this, that it means in some way, shape or form there was some harm in it for us. Because the commandments of Islam are not arbitrary. It's not Allah told you that, you know, making life difficult here, making life a little easier, it's like a game of chess or whatever. No. What Islam is, is the best way of life for man spiritually and materially. So the things which are prohibited in Islam are the things which are harmful to us, either as individuals as, or as a community, either materially speaking, in a physical sense, or spiritually speaking. There is harm in it. So this is why we have been commanded to do this. Better you do it. Do this. Because these things are beneficial to us. 
And other things which you are forbidden are harmful to us. And this is a part of our faith. As Allah says in the Quran, Ma atakum rasul fakudu, whatever the Prophet is giving you, take it. Umar haqum anhu fakudu, whatever is forbidden you, leave it. It's for your benefit. So generations of Muslims chose to follow the way of the Prophet Muhammad lying on the right side, with their knees bent, or at least lying on their back, but not on their stomach. <coughs> In recent times, the last ten years, the medical profession, those people who specialize in problems of the back have concluded that the major problem of what is called slow back, curvature of the spine in old age, you know, collapsing of the uh, vertebrae, the major cause, because they, they, they give a list of things to avoid damaging your back. You know. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Number one on the list was, do not sleep on your stomach. So how about Number one, they explained what? When they explained that this is your spinal cord, is the heaviest bone structure in your body. What is in front of it is just intestines and soft organs. When you lie on the stomach when it sags downwards, it has no support. That's so why people who got bad back, they give them a, a bed which is like a board and put them to sleep on your back. You have support for the spine to help it straighten back out again. They recommend it that you sleep on your side with your knees bent. It's something, you know, we just found out in the last 10 to years. But Muslims didn't have to wait, you know, 1400 years to find out before they started doing it. No, they started doing it from the time of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, don't do it. And in recent times, those medical experts who have studied the causes of what they call SDS, sudden death syndrome, or cut death amongst children, they find it the kids. Three, four years old, two years old, one years old, and die. So the doctor's recommending do not put your children to sleep on this doctor. This is within the last two years. Okay. Research in England, it was published in the paper. And this is just one example I'm giving. There are many other things. From the Sukhna where the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu has told us to do certain things or not to do other things. That's, you know, we may not be able to discover and determine really what is the, the, the rationale behind it. Where is really that harm that is in there? You know, where is really the good that is in there? We can't see it, obviously. But we do not hold up the practice of Islam until we see it. We believe that it is for our benefit. So we will follow the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam the line. Believing that what he has commanded is from Allah and it is the best way for us. And though it is natural for us to follow a madhab, a way of scholars, individual or as a group, because the process of seeking knowledge is a perpetual process from the time you were born to the time you die. And the gaining of knowledge has to be through the media of the We are not independent, so independent that we are now receiving revelation and we can make decisions. No, no. We, we gather based on what we gather. We grow based on the knowledge that was gathered by those before us. So there is nothing wrong in following a map. However, it has to be kept within the context of it being the result of human efforts which will have within it certain errors which we should not knowingly follow because to do so is to attack the foundation of our faith. We may follow with an open mind wherever the evidence comes which seems to be stronger, we'll believe and we 
Still from there, or we'll just still from there and carry on in this particular path we're going? We're open, flexible. Because no one has perfect knowledge. All of us are in need of others. So, our approach in Islam should be one of commitment to the foundations of our faith, appreciation of the struggles and efforts of those who came before us, understanding and practicing the Quran and Sunnah as it was understood and practiced by the early generation of Muslim, righteous Muslim scholars, and being flexible